Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Bill H. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. Just a quick FYI, there will be no video uploaded from me tomorrow on Friday. I'm going to Penn State this weekend. One of my best friends is launching a clothing company on campus and we might go to the Ohio State game. So my next upload will be on Monday. First up today, when Tesla lowered prices in China, they also made the midnight silver paint option free, but that didn't last long as now it's again a paid option. No official reason was given for the change for this now being a paid option again around 1100 US dollars, but there have been multiple reports of a large influx of orders. Next up, this picture was taken at the Twitter HQ. There was a little impromptu chat with some employees, but can we just take a second to appreciate how fit, healthy, and happy Elon seems to look right now? You love to see it. Another quick one here, Tesla girl on Twitter asked what this new icon was. I believe it's the blended braking. So if your regen is limited for whatever reason, Tesla can now automatically apply the physical brakes to simulate that experience. That's what that icon is. Next up, we have an actual physical real Tesla recall, but it's not what you may think. This recall impacts Model 3s from 2017 to this year and listen to the problem description. The second row left seat belt buckle and second row center seat belt anchor may have been incorrectly reassembled during vehicle service. So this is not a factory defect, but rather something that happened at service appointments. Tesla service will inspect and reassemble the seat belt anchors as necessary free of charge. Here we have some good news when it comes to third party charging. A Reddit user shared this screenshot of EVgo. Auto Charge Plus is now available for Tesla vehicles with a CCS Combo 1 adapter. EVgo Auto Charge Plus means no tapping, no cards, just plug in and charge, mimicking the supercharger experience. There is an enrollment process to get this set up, but once you do that and you have the CCS adapter, you just pull up to these EVgo stations, plug in, charge, it'll pay automatically, and you're on your way. So hopefully Electrify America and others will follow suit. Next up, we have an analyst that works at Uber that put together this report to show us how things are going between Tesla and Hertz, that partnership that allows Uber drivers to rent Teslas for the week. 95% of drivers had never driven an EV before entering this program, and now 77% believe they will either stay with the program or buy an EV of their own. In just the last year alone, there have been 5 million trips covering around 40 million miles in 30 different markets that have prevented 2.1 million gallons of gas from being used. In case you're not familiar with this program, as an Uber driver, you can basically rent one of these Tesla Model 3s effectively from Hertz for the week, around $330 depending on where you're at, you also get an extra dollar per ride up to $4,000 every year. And again, as an Uber driver, you get 45% off charging at EVgo. So far, all signs point to this partnership being off to a great start, but the question remains, how will this impact Uber's overall profitability, a problem it's been trying to solve now for years? Moving on, just a quick one here, because it is only one month of data and it is the third month of the quarter, meaning typically the highest import month for Teslas in Europe. Either way, Model Y topped new vehicle registrations in Europe in September. I'm sharing this because it's the first time the Model Y has led the rankings in Europe. It also will not be the last. In September, 29,367 Model Ys were registered in the month. Next up, there's a reason anytime we see an MOU or a memorandum of understanding we have to designate it's not a done deal, Exhibit A. Tesla had one of these MOUs with Australia's core lithium and the deadline has basically passed without an agreement. The CEO of Core said, I wanna thank Tesla for the time taken to negotiate with Core and look forward to maintaining an open and ongoing dialogue. I'd love to have a reason, but of course we don't yet have one. Many of you know I've been taking Athletic Greens, the sponsor of today's video, for over a year now. And I think it's worth noting that Lex is still recommending it where I first found it, 
and other channels that I value like the Institute of Human Anatomy are also suggesting it as a way to help in fixing this. The modern American diet of the masses is just atrocious. Processed food, lacking in key vitamins and minerals, and I'm confident in saying 75% of the people I've encountered in life have very little idea of how good our bodies are designed to feel. I'm not saying AG1 is some miracle supplement, but it all starts from the inside out and ensuring that we don't lack key nutrients. AG1 has 75 vitamins, minerals, and probiotics that when taken regularly can support your energy, your focus, recovery, and your gut health. And I'm telling you, gut health is one of the most overlooked aspects when it comes to our overall well-being. I'm confident in recommending AG1 in part because it's independently certified by NSF. Go ahead and Google it and see for yourself. So if you use my link in the description below, you can get five travel packs and a one year supply of vitamin D3K2 for free with every new purchase. What's the point of getting wealthy with Tesla stock if we're not well enough to enjoy it? Okay, shifting back to EV land. We have been talking now for a few months about one of the biggest storylines in automotive are going to be Chinese EV makers flooding the European market and potentially the United States market later. It's already happening, but over the next 12 to 24 months, things could accelerate pretty rapidly. Some industry leaders are saying their ascendance, meaning the Chinese EV makers, will reshape the continents, talking about Europe's automotive landscape over the next decade. Of course, this takeover for Chinese EV makers will not be without challenges, two of which are customers being unfamiliar with Chinese brands and political leaders wary of China's master plans. In case you haven't heard about these plans, by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the PRC, he, Xi Jinping, wants to ensure the nation leads the world in terms of composite national strength and international influence. Another storyline we've mentioned is that how some of these Chinese EV companies are actually backed by the Chinese state, meaning they have super deep pockets, which could allow them to do things like this that the CEO of Stellantis, Carlos Tavares, has been pointing out. He's assuming that these Chinese EV companies are going to sell their vehicles at a loss in order to undercut European brands to grow their market share. Because of this, Tavares has been calling for the EU to impose tariffs on cars imported from China. Already in the first six months of this year, one in every 20 EVs sold in Europe has been from a Chinese backed brand. We won't get into all of them, but BYD is going to have three new models in the region before the end of this year, and we know that NEO has European expansion plans as well. And if things go well for BYD, NEO, and others in the European market, you better believe there will be factories to follow, both from BYD and NEO who are already in preliminary talks. And since we all love data, here we have global EV sales for the top 20 manufacturers. Darker blue is full battery electric vehicles and the lighter plug-in hybrids. The horizontal size of each bar is showing us the number of EVs sold through the first half of this year. What's also neat is the vertical size of these bars is showing us the year over year growth, the first half of this year compared to the first half of last year. For example, BYD has grown in the first half of this year 320% compared to the same time frame last year, and for Tesla, that number was 46%. So you can pause the screen if you'd like, but I really like this visual breakdown. And again, Tesla's still the clear, full BEV leader. And again, pause if you'd like, but here's the bottom part of the chart. And one more chart, the dark blue is the first half 2021, and the light blue is the first half of this year, EV sales broken down by region. So the EV market in North America definitely growing with the overall auto market definitely shrinking, but we still have a lot of work to do. All right, let's shift gears for a second into the macro, both GDP and jobless claims. GDP for Q3, the first reading came in at an annual rate of 2.6%. So if you divide that by four, for quarter three alone, the economy grew at 0.65%. But I wanna clarify something. You see how this says real GDP? And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see current dollar GDP. So the government basically computes the size of the economy in two different ways. One is in nominal dollar terms and the other is in real dollar terms. 
So current or nominal dollar GDP tallies the value of all goods and services produced in the US using present prices. On the other hand, real or otherwise referred to as chained dollar GDP counts only the value of what was physically produced. Here's an example. Let's say we have a hat factory that sold $1 million worth of hats in 2021. This was actually 11% more than they sold in 2020. The $1 million represents the nominal company sales or the current dollar sales. However, something is missing. From this number alone, it's not clear if the factory achieved that extra income from selling 11% more hats, or did it sell the same number of hats as the year before, but they raised prices by 11%. So if the factory made more money because it increased the price tag by 11%, then in real or constant dollar terms, the true volume of hats sold this year was no greater than last year. Basically, it's really important to know if the economy grew because the quantity of products sold was greater, or was it because there were price hikes and inflation? What we want to see are real increases in economic output, which means a greater supply of goods and services available for consumers. So higher real GDP improves the standard of living of Americans, whereas GDP growth due to inflation actually erodes living standards because people have to pay more for the same amount of products consumed before. I think it's important to point out that even goods that were not sold but ended up on stockroom shelves are included in the GDP because those products were still assembled. So the GDP reflects the final value of all output in the US economy, regardless of whether it was sold or placed in inventory. And this is not the place for me to get into too much more depth here, but just know that fluctuations in certain things like international trade can really impact this number. And also we have one or two quarters earlier this year that were down, this quarter it's up a bit. So net net, we're actually still kind of treading water. So if you saw this 2.6 number and got a little fired up thinking the economy is on fire, I would just say <laughs> tread cautiously. And just real quick on the jobless claims front, the number came in at 217,000 the consensus estimate was 220,000. Remember, ordinarily this would be a good reading, but right now the Fed wants higher unemployment, it wants more joblessness to slow down the economy, so we want a higher number here and we didn't really get it. And yes, since the end of September there has been some level of slowdown taking place. However, if you put it into context and you look at an initial jobless claims chart dating back over 20 years, you'll see that historically, we're still currently at historically low levels. So simply put, the macro readings came in kind of mixed this morning, which no surprise gives us kind of a mixed stock market. Next up, we have another note from Adam Jonas and Morgan Stanley. And real quick, shout out to Sawyer Merritt. He shared this to his super followers. If you're on Twitter, I would highly encourage giving him a super follow. He deserves it. The gist of the note is that Jonas and Morgan Stanley think there will be ICE investing opportunities the next three to five years and that the transition to EVs may see a slowdown due to higher costs and other factors. Reason number one, some of the OEM executives recently at the Paris Auto Show have been questioning the phase out of ICE vehicles around 2035, basically complaining about China has low cost competition and the input costs are high, basically complaining about how hard it is to make a profitable EV. Reason number two, earlier this week, we talked about GM pushing back its EV targets due to a slower launch of cell impact production than they expected. They also believe EV adoption in the US may be facing affordability headwinds that may not be fully offset by the IRA tax credit benefits. I don't wanna misrepresent what Jonas is saying here. They're still bullish on EVs long-term and they also believe that ICE is a zero terminal value enterprise, meaning eventually they'll be worthless, but ICE may generate sufficient cash flows for the next five to 10 years to justify a positive net present value. And finally, they said, we think investors would be very interested in the ICE derived businesses of GM, Ford, and their suppliers if they could get direct access to them without the risks of reinvesting the cash flows into low or negative return on invested capital EV projects. Meaning if these companies could spin off their EV business to be invested in separately, that could create an investment opportunity for people to buy into the ICE side of the business. I could spend a while talking about this, but what do you guys think? 
Last up for today, I just wanna hammer home the point that you may have already seen Argo AI is shutting down. And I know most people don't follow Argo AI that closely, so it's kind of like whatever. The point is this really highlights the fact of how insanely difficult solving FSD really is. And further, of the 2000 or so employees that were at Argo, some are going to be offered jobs at Ford, some at VW, but to the rest that will be let go, maybe Tesla can scoop up a few. And perhaps most importantly, listen to what Farley said. We're optimistic about a future for level four ADAS, but profitable, fully autonomous vehicles at scale are a long way off, and we won't necessarily have to create that technology ourselves. This is crucial because at this point, I firmly believe that no small company working on solving FSD is going to solve the problem. You have to have data and you have to have it at scale. Tesla is doing this far and away in the best way. And don't get it twisted. I want Ford to succeed, but I don't forget things like this. Stephen Armstrong, the vice president of Ford Motor, quote tweeted Elon celebrating 7,000 cars in seven days back in 2018. And Steven took a little shot at Elon saying 7,000 cars in four hours. This tweet is one of many that is setting up to age like milk. Don't forget two things, no video upload from me tomorrow, Friday, I'll be in Penn State. And two, don't forget to check out AG1 linked below and get your freebies. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Please like the video if you did. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.